as the first airplane capable of sustained cruising at supersonic speeds, the B-58 presented a unique problem. How to escape safely in case of emergency from aircraft performing long-range, high-altitude military air operations. In solving this problem, several demands had to be met. The most important was the provision of a proper environment for survival during ejection, descent, and landing. In this last category, both ground and water landings had to be reckoned with, as well as a range of climatic conditions varying from tropical to arctic. Other requirements were that the system should allow full in-flight operational freedom for the crew at all three stations and installation in the tactical aircraft with a minimum of modification. Going beyond these specifications, the Air Force and Convair working together hoped to provide a basic design of escape system capable of broader application than ever before envisioned. This meant discarding the design approach involving the detachment of an entire section of the fuselage for escape. It also meant that the ejection system evolved for the B-58 must fit the space envelope requirements for current conventional seats of any or all high-performance aircraft. A starting point was found in the ejection seat of some years ago. In line with the space envelope concept, an interim ejection seat fitting the conventional rails and requiring no change in the canopy or cockpit was developed for the B-58. This system incorporates several major improvements. One is the addition of extremity restraints, which will ensure far better protection against flailing after ejection than the current standard seat. Another is the replacement of the standard catapult by a rocket catapult to provide greater force for safe clearance. While the interim system remains just that, an intermediate step pending development of the fully perfected escape system, this equipment is currently the best available. Meanwhile, under contract from Convair, the Stanley Aviation Corporation of Denver, a small but highly capable concern, was awarded the task and is now designing and developing an escape capsule for the tactical B-58. Despite its present familiarity, that word capsule is still significant for it embodies the principle of total encapsulation, which is the only possible answer for a crew survival at the speeds of modern aircraft. Now, let's turn to an animated representation to see how the escape capsule, as installed in the B-58, will provide this maximum safety for all crew members, as well as accomplish other basic targets of its design. Again, using the conventional rails of the original ejection systems and requiring no major structural changes, the capsule has two configurations. One for the pilot station and another for each of the two crew stations. Their basic principle of operation, however, is the same. For purposes of demonstration, let's concentrate on the pilot station. As an example of operational freedom for the crew, the capsule having its own pressure, oxygen, and recovery systems eliminates the need for pressure suits, bailout bottles, and parachutes. Thus, the pilot and other crew members enjoy the same self-sufficiency at high altitudes as at low. This shirt sleeve flying also contributes greatly to crew efficiency. Now, in slow motion, Let's follow the pre-ejection and escape cycle. In case of high altitude decompression, the pilot seeks immediate protection by closing the capsule. Note how the flight control stick, being an integral part of the capsule, permits control of the plane from inside the capsule. Another important advantage is that even with the capsule closed, he can still communicate with the second and third flight station. Next, by means of push-button controls on the stick, he can move the center of gravity forward, retard the throttle, and fly down to a habitable altitude. Observe how the large front window allows him a view of his primary flight instruments. Once arrived at lower altitude, 
He may now raise the capsule door manually and continue flight. In case the airplane must be abandoned, the pilot waits for the crew members in the third and second stations to eject. He then squeezes the release handle for ejection of his own capsule. After the canopy has been jettisoned, the catapult is actuated and the capsule ejects. The rocket reduces the deceleration rate while the stabilization system prevents tumbling and excessive G's on the occupant. With escape being made at less than 15,000 feet, the recovery system is actuated when the capsule reaches its peak of trajectory. First, the stabilization system is automatically detached as a deceleration bag, whose prime function we'll see later, inflates to aid in deployment of the main recovery chute. Should escape have to be effected above 15,000 feet, an aneroid device puts the recovery system into operation. In either case, outrigger booms are ballistically swedged into an extended position. As will soon appear, their purpose is to aid landing on the ground or at sea. Hanging by two riser lines from the main recovery chute, the capsule floats down at a rate of 25 feet per second. Its landing attitude is 36 degrees toe down from the vertical, while the deceleration bag is so located as to receive the mass of the impact. On impact, the chute is detached so that the capsule will not be dragged and the crew member can free himself without difficulty. Now let's see what happens in the case of a water landing. When the capsule submerges, bladders which are actuated by a water sensing device inflate. Its downward motion quickly arrested, the pressurized capsule returns to the surface. Its four flotation outriggers hold it in a fairly stable position. One requirement for the capsule is the capability to withstand 72 hours of high seas. Gear packaged for easy availability within the capsule has been carefully designed and selected to give maximum aid and survival on the water and on land, whether under tropic or arctic conditions. Whatever the environment, the capsule may serve as a valuable shelter. This completes the escape cycle. Before leaving it, let's go over the key stages in its operation again. First, ejection. Next, the deployment of the stabilization system, followed by that of the main recovery system. Finally, note how the ground landing is made with the capsule in a toe-down position with the deceleration bag making impact tolerable. While at sea, the outrigger bladders do their job of keeping the capsule stable until rescue. To ensure meeting specifications, a thorough program for testing the capsule's components is underway. For instance, here the booms on these same outriggers are having to prove they can hold the locked position over the required three days of rough sea conditions. Here, Stanley technicians using a 510 pound mass to simulate the weight of capsule and man, test drop the deceleration bag to assure satisfactory slowing of the capsule before impact. At the Joint Navy Air Force Parachute Test Center, El Centro, California, trials of several configurations for the main parachute and the capsule's recovery system were made for selection of the one achieving best performance figures. Similarly, choice of the stabilization chute with its vital role in crew survival during ejection was based on a series of tests for as many as 11 competing configurations. The chute seen under test here happens to be the winner. Other tests based on the principle of simulating the weight, center of gravity, and aerodynamic properties of the actual capsule are being conducted at Mesa, Arizona and Hurricane Mesa, Utah to ensure that performances measure up to specifications. 
Today, under the impetus of this many-sided program of design, test, modification, and retest, the escape capsule is approaching finalized form. Present plans call for its installation in tactical aircraft being delivered in late 1960. It will be retrofitted in the field to all B-58s previously delivered to the Air Force. As we look beyond the B-58 and further into the future, the basic concept of the totally encapsulated seat may find broad application to all supersonic aircraft. And so the escape capsule may well have achieved a new Kitty Hawk in the realm of air safety. Starting at 1610 on 11 September 1959, a series of tests over a span of three days was conducted on the B-58 escape capsule two and a half miles off Key West, Florida. Here we see a flotation test in progress under the supervision of the Aerospace Medical Laboratory of ARDC with the support of the U.S. Navy. The subject was Master Sergeant William Barber. This test was designed to give data on both the flotation capability of the capsule itself and of the crewmen to survive on the rations and equipment stored inside. The water leakage rate was approximately one quart an hour, which proved to be controllable. Since it takes eight gallons of water to reach the occupant, Sergeant Barber stayed above the seawater level throughout the 68 hours of the test. The subject performed various survival exercises, such as rigging his parachute for shade, signaling aircraft, and so on. The accidental puncturing of the water curtain ended the test four hours short of the Schedule 72. Its reinforcement was found to be necessary and a weakening of the flotation bladders at the point of attachment to the outrigger booms was also discovered. After three days and nights under conditions approximating those of actual survival at sea, the subject was found to be in excellent shape. Scene of the fourth B-58 capsule sled test was again the Hurricane Supersonic Research Site at Hurricane Mesa, Utah. A modified stabilization boom with fin added and a new parachute container of heavier construction were used. This fourth run, made at 538 knots, showed greater stability and better flight characteristics but even further improvements are needed. The parachute used here for the first time in slug testing was the 38.5 ring slot chute. Upon full deployment of the chute, several riser lines were broken. Full recovery of the capsule occurred below the mesa level. The cause is being investigated. Impact was on the extremely rugged Mesa slopes, but the small damage to the slug gave assurance of survival for an actual occupant. Other tests will follow at high and low speeds and including single and multiple ejections. <laughs> 